Welcome back, everybody, to episode 27 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which will today be all about levitated nanoparticles in the quantum regime. As usual, we would like to have your questions. Please send us your questions via email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to join us for a discussion with our speaker after today's talk, please use the Zoom link that I'm going to post at the end of the talk into the YouTube chat. And as usual, note that there is a 30 second time delay between what you see uh, on YouTube and what we do. And with that, I would like to hand over to Ofer, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Sebastian. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Professor Uriel Romero Izard from the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information, or ICOCI, in the University of Innsbruck. Professor Romero Izard studied physics in the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, where he also obtained his PhD for his work on quantum strongly correlated systems. He was a postdoc and later on an associate researcher in the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in the theory group of Ignacio Zirac, and in 2012 received the national prize for a new researcher in theoretical physics from the Royal Physical Society of Spain. He joined the University of Innsbruck in 2013 and he received an ERC starting grant that year and the QIPC Young Investigator Award in 2015. Professor Romero Izad studies quantum physics, um, generally with emphasis on quantum simulations and quantum information processing and the foundations of quantum mechanics. He actually works on a vast range of systems uh, in collaboration with experimental groups from the generate quantum gases to quantum nano optics and nanomechanics and nanomagnetism. And as you may expect from this list, he is also into levitating things. So there might be even an ignobel in the horizon. So without further ado, it is a pleasure to host Professor Romero Izar today, who will talk about levitating nanoparticles in the quantum regime. Uriol, thank you for coming. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Offer, for this nice uh, introduction. Uh, we will not levitate frogs, uh, even though that might be interesting. Uh, so first of all, let me thank all of you for putting together this uh, super nice uh, seminar series. So that's really great, uh, all the time and effort you have put from the very beginning of the pandemic to keep us united. And this is really, really nice. So thank you very much. Also, of course, thank you very much for giving me the great opportunity to present our work in this setting. So. It, which I feel very privileged and also a bit intimidated. So as you see, I put in the background a photo of the mountains of Innsbruck so that we get some fresh air in these uh, difficult and challenging times, especially now in, East in Austria that we are in on a hard lockdown. Okay. So today I want to talk about a topic uh, we are very excited about, and this is on levitated nanoparticles in the quantum regime. And I would like to start uh, discussing about this topic from a high uh, picture, from a high level. So. Let me recall that here, basically, we talk a lot on about quantum optics. And in quantum optics, this is basically a success story based on understanding, controlling, and using quantum degrees of freedom in nature. And in this series of seminars, we have seen a plethora of different systems where this is done. Of course, to observe quantum phenomena, we require isolation. And indeed, when we learn about the Schrodinger cat, we should all recall that uh, actually this cat is not isolated. It is breeding and it is, has some temperature, so it's emitting thermal radiation. So it is basically the definition of being alive that means you are interacting with the environment. So of course, this cat would suffer uh, decoherence. However, so as I say, in quantum optics, therefore, we just understand, control, and use quantum degrees of freedom and isolation is required to prevent decoherence. So in this talk, I basically want to discuss this with levitated objects. Namely, we want to understand, control, and use the quantum degrees of freedom that there are in uh, levitated objects, levitated nanoparticles. And I like to think this is a bit of a top-down approach to quantum physics or, or quantum optics instead of taking atoms and, and making systems more complex here, we just take a piece of material, a solid, we just make it sufficiently small so that it can levitate on a tweezer, for instance, and we then want to bring this system to the quantum regime. And as I hopefully will be, or will try to convince you in this talk, we believe this is a field full of, uh, uh, with unique opportunities for both applied and fundamental research. 
So let me start with the background of that research field. So that's a story that actually begins in the 70s with the seminal work of Arthur Ashkin. Okay, indeed, as most of this audience in the seminar know, Arthur Ashkin invented the optical tweezers, which allows you to trap polarizable objects uh, at the maximum of the intensity of the laser light. And for instance, this, can, this has a, a, a very large impact in biosciences because you can trap a bacterium like, like what this experimentally is doing now uh, that is suspended in liquid and then do nasty things uh, with, the, with the bacterium. And, and, and as soon as you switch off the laser, then the, 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 the particle in that sense of bacterium is, is free to move. So optical tweezers also had an impact on AMO because that inspired the possibility to trap atoms and cool atoms uh, and, and so on. And in a sense, in 2010, inspired by, by this work of, of Ashkin and, and the AMO community and optomechanics, some of us proposed to optically levitate the dielectric nanoparticle in vacuum, not in liquid, but now in vacuum with a laser light to, and then place it inside an optical cavity and use the uh, cavity modes and the radiation pressure of the light to cool down the center of mass eventually to the quantum regime and then maybe prepare quantum superposition states. And of course, this has a relation with cavity optomechanics. We are also interested in controlling in the quantum regime a massive object like this uh, mirror here. But the key difference is that in levitation, uh, there is an absence of a mechanical support. And therefore, the mechanical object or it's, it's allowed to be freely translated, rotated, and even dropped if you switch off the, the harmonic potential. And that's, of course, something that you cannot do if you have a clamped uh, system. And we will exploit these, these ideas. So now we are in, 10, 000, uh, in 2020, 10 years later. And actually, that's a real picture of an experiment where you see an optically levitated particle in vacuum. You see the scattered light of the particle. And this is done in the Lucas Novoni lab at ETH in Zurich. So this is today a rather well-established uh, research field, which is very dynamic and is growing very fast. And we like to call it levitodynamics, which in a sense that would be related to the study of levitated objects in vacuum. Just to give you for instance, uh, an image of the activity. So this is just a, a list I compiled before the talk of all the groups uh, I know uh, uh, that are uh, doing experiments on levitated nanoparticles. And it's always hard to, to keep track of the new group. So I really apologize if I, I forgot uh, any group that's always dangerous when you make such a long list. And uh, this list is actually uh, very impressive, but it has a very negative uh, thing that I want to say, which is that out of all these names only one PI is a woman, and that's actually Tracy Northup from, from Innsbruck from here. So I hope uh, this will improve in the future because I know all these groups have amazing uh, PhD students and postdoc uh, uh, women. Okay, so let me now show you what are what what are the advances in terms of experiments in this field? So I'm a theorist, but of course collaborate with experimentalists. So I hopefully will be able still to give you an overview of the experimental progress in the field. So the first goal was to try to cool the center of mass motion to the quantum regime. And just to give you some numbers, so these nanoparticles are trapped in harmonic potentials, which have typical frequencies in quantum optics of the order of 100 kilohertz. But of course, they are large. They have a radius of 100 nanometers, and they have a mass that corresponds to 10 to the 10 atoms. OK, so this is a big object. So that means that to cool down the particle to the ground state, you have to reduce the thermal fluctuations of the center of mass motion to the ultimate quantum limit. And this is set by the so-called zero point motion length scale in harmonic oscillator, which is given by that formula. And if you plug these numbers, you get now 10 to the minus 12 meters. And in AMO, uh, typical zero point motion for an atom in a trap is of few nanometers, uh, maybe tens. This is much, much smaller because the mass is bigger. Okay, and in, in terms of temperature, that's micro kelvins. So that means that if we want to cool these particles to the quantum regime, we have to make sure we remove these fluctuations up to this limit, up to 10 to the minus 12 meters, which is a length scale much, much smaller than the nuclei of an atom. So this, I think, shows why is, of course, this uh, rather challenging. But nevertheless, many experimentalists during the last 10 years have attempted to, to cool and, and have learned how to cool better the center of mass motion. And here I just show you uh, a bit uh, some experiments. Each dot is a different experimental paper. On the x-axis, I have the years in the last 10 years. And on the y-axis, the phonon number, which somehow quantifies 
how large the fluctuations are. To get to the quantum regime, you would need to be close to one phonon, which means getting to the ground state of the harmonic oscillator and even below. And here, the orange dots are actually experiments um, uh, done by uh, feedback cooling. That means you measure the particle, you know where it is and where it is moving, and you act with a force to, to cool down or to decrease the kinetic energy. And in blue dots, these are cavity-based uh, cooling experiments where the cooling is done passively by just putting the particle in a cavity and, in a sense, using the radiation pressure to, to cool down as in optomechanics. And if you look closely, in this year, very recently, there have been two important milestones. First, in the group of Marcus Aspelmeyer in Vienna, they have achieved actually a cooling to the motional ground state by cooling below one phonon number in a cavity experiment. And in the group of Lucas Novoni, using feedback cooling without cavities, they have also cooled to the to four phonons. And in that uh, low temperature, you can already see uh, the, uh, the, uh, the quantum fluctuations of the motion by, by for instance, seeing what is called uh, the, the, the sideband asymmetry. And if you're interested about the cavity cooling experiments, we have a, a long paper that we wrote in collaboration with uh, the group of Lucas Novoni, uh, analyzing uh, all what needs to be done in order to cool to the quantum regime with the cavity. Good. So that's regarding cooling. That's very exciting. This milestone of, of achieving the quantum regime has been achieved a few months ago. So, and this has to do with the center of mass motion. And to cool down the center of mass motion, you need to isolate it very well. And this automatically makes that these nanoparticles are very good oscillators. They have a very high mechanical quality oscillator, uh, uh, quality factor. And therefore, automatically, in the same progress, you are building very good sensors. And here I also show you, based on this recent review, which is very nice, some experiments done in terms of showing force sensitivity and acceleration sensitivity. So let's look at this left plot. On the x-axis, I have the mass of the nanoparticle. And on the y-axis, I have the force sensitivity in newtons, uh, if you measure on a, on a second scale. Every dot is a single experiment. And the color code tells you how recent they are. So the bluish, uh, the, they are the, the more recent. And you see that. Uh, to, to measure forces, you need small particles. And you can now experiments measure forces as small as 10 to the minus 20 newtons. At the same time, in the same type of experiments, if you use bigger masses, you then also have very good accelerometers. So you can also measure acceleration with a very high sensitivity. And this is acceleration in units of G, the gravitational acceleration generated by the Earth. And you see that the best, exp or the, yeah, some experiments measure uh, the G or accelerations up to the level of 10 to the minus 7 Gs. So that would mean knowing uh, G to be 9.8 and 7 digits. Okay, So this is uh, really exciting and impressive. At the same time, apart from center of mass motion, also many experimentalists were interested in other degrees of freedom, and in particular, rotational degrees of freedom. And for instance, there are these experiments where you have a nano belt, two nanoparticles that are kind of attached to each other, and they can put into uh, rotation. And, and, and for instance, uh, there have been experiments where they rotate these nanoparticles to gigahertz frequencies. And gigahertz frequencies means this nano, nano dumbbell makes 1 billion turns per second. Okay. And you cannot accelerate them more. You cannot make them rotate faster because at that frequency, the centrifugal force starts to be comparable to the tensile strength of the material. So if you try to spin them more, basically, they just explode out of centrifugal force. At the same time, these fast rotating nanoparticles, they are ultra stable and very sensitive to external torques. So this is also a direction uh, some experimentalists are interested to use these rotating particles as, as torques, as sensors. At the same time, there have been also very recent experiments where these nanoparticles are coupled to single uh, quantum systems, uh, in particular, single spin qubits. In the group of Gabriel Getet in Nature, uh, there is this beautiful experiment where a nanodiamond is levitated. And the liberation mode of this nanodiamond is coupled to some, to some MBs that are inside the nanodiamond. And in that sense, they have some spin mechanical coupling that can be used for instance, by, uh, to cool uh, the liberation mode of this nanodiamond. Also in the group of, uh, uh, so in the experiments of Jan Gisela 
in the group of uh, Misha looking at Harvard in a, in, a, in a collaboration with us giving input as, as theories, there were these nice experiments where a magnet was levitated and magnetically coupled to a single MB that was on a diamond slab. And in that sense, you could probe or you could uh, observe the motion of the magnet with a single MB. And this is exciting because, of course, this is putting non-linearities into the mechanical dynamics of levitated nanoparticles, which can be a source of uh, interesting uh, uh, quantum states in the future. So, as you see, the field started by performing optical levitation of the electric nanoparticles, but today to trap, cool, and measure the nanoparticle can be done using not only optical forces, but also electrically, by charging the nanoparticle, putting it in a pole trap, and so on. Also magnetically, to, uh, by using magnetic traps or diamagnetic levitation, and so on. So this has expanded a lot. And of course, also the type of particles. Nowadays, experimentalists levitate the electric nanoparticles, but also mag magnets, metals, diamonds, and other crystals, even superconducting particles, graphene, and even superfluid helium. So and that's a bit the spirit. The idea is now to levitate any piece of material that you might find interesting and try to isolate it from the environment and bring it maybe to the quantum regime or study other things. And also shapes, as I showed, not only spheres, but also rods, dumbbells, and platelets. Good, so at this, at this moment, one could answer, okay, yeah, that's a lot of progress, but why is this interesting? So what are the implications? Why, why, why are uh, this uh, community of scientists or, or some, uh, amount of scientists interested in that. And somehow we like to divide the type of applications in four areas that I would like to briefly discuss. The first one is very fundamental. So these nanoparticles can be levitated, can be very well isolated from the environment and have already been brought to the quantum regime. But furthermore, these nanoparticles can now, or, or one could think about delocalizing the center of mass and preparing macroscopic quantum superpositions. And, in, and indeed, in this talk, I will talk about this at the second part. And this is interesting because, of course, it can allow us to explore the classical uh, to quantum transition, to falsify collapse models that predict the breakdown of quantum mechanics, and perhaps even to explore the interplay of quantum mechanics of gravity with asking questions such as, what is the gravitational field generated by a massive object in a microscopic superposition? The second area of interest is related to uh, using these nanoparticles as sensors, where you have seen there is already some progress, but now this progress should be used to uh, address interesting uh, qu scientific questions. And for instance, there are two types of uh, applications, one also very fundamental, to basically use this highly sensitive uh, detector to detect new physics and to profit that these nanoparticles have a high mass density. And I give you an example. For instance, it would be very interesting to measure the gravity Newton's law at short distances. Okay, so some high, high energy physics uh, theories predict that there should be corrections at short distances. And this is pat parameterized with this Yukawa type of uh, uh, potential, uh, therefore force, which tells us that if the distance is smaller than lambda, g could be larger by a factor alpha. And for instance, below a micrometer scale, uh, this has not been measured or not very well. So it, it has not been excluded that g could be much larger than the value at larger scales. And this is very interesting. Also, not only to measure forces at short distances, but also to measure ultra weak interactions that could be caused, for instance, uh, of, because of the nanoparticle interacting with dark matter. And there are many people that are interested in that. At the same time, these sensors could be used for real technological applications. As we say, these nanoparticles that are levitating are very sensitive. So one could think about using them for inertial navigation or gravimetry and so on. The third area of application is to recall that these nanoparticles are solids. They are solids, so these are materials. And actually, so far in the field, people have been focused mainly on center of mass and rotational degrees of freedom. But actually, in our group, we have proposed to start to look inside the nanoparticles and address the internal degrees of freedom that any solid state system has, such as acoustic phonons and how they interact with the center of mass and so on. At the same time, from the material science point of view, these nanoparticles can be put to extreme stress by spinning them really fast and at the same time isolate them really well from the environment. And this is, yeah, a, a very nice uh, scenario. One could even explore whether you can induce phase transitions or even synthesize some type of materials under these extreme conditions. 
Last but not least, these nanoparticles are also useful to study non-equilibrium physics. The reason is that these uh, mechanical oscillators are in harmonic potentials, but actually these potentials you can deform and you can have other type of potentials such as double wells. You can control really well the type of noise that you put into the system by either having better vacuum or less. So you can have either conservative dynamics or more dissipative, so you can control the environment. And furthermore, you could even think about having many particles and look at the statistical physics of these levitated particles, both in the classical and in the quantum regime. So in a sense, these are kind of simulators of, 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 uh, of uh, non-equilibrium physics. Uh, where you study really real materials. Okay, so this is, I hope, uh, a good uh, introduction uh, to the topic, and I hope uh, you, you are a, a bit as excited as I am about about, about this field. And now, uh, in the second part of the talk, I would like to focus and tell you a bit something that that we are doing in the group. Okay, so just. To make it clear, because I talked a lot about, an exp about experiments, we had a theory group. And as any theory group in quantum optics, we do a theory and we study this problem, uh, these nanoparticles and how they interact with the environment really carefully and with a lot of detail. Then we also propose experiments and we'd like to collaborate with experimentalists. Of course, there will be many interesting things I would like to tell you about the theoretical, more theoretical aspects of levitodynamics. But I think that in the broad audience of this seminar, I prefer to focus on a, on a proposal that we are uh, finishing up that I think will will have maybe uh, will, could be better or could be of, 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 of interest for, for a broader community. So in that sense, from all these applications in the group, we are really interested in all the aspects, but definitely from all of them, there is the, the part of microscopic quantum physics, which is really exciting and, and, and we are very interested on in that. So I would like to talk about a proposal uh, related to, to that area. And this is about how to delocalize the center of mass of a nanoparticle over larger scales. And this is a project that uh, has been done by a postdoc in the group, Talita Weiss, a PhD student, Marc uh, Rudal Urdes, and in collaboration with, uh, with Eric Torrontegui, who is at CSIC Madrid and is an expert in optimal control techniques. And we are talking a lot with our experimental collaborators. Um, OK. So let me put this into context. And I, I like to discuss this, this very uh, qualitative uh, graph uh, where on the x-axis, I, I discuss the quantum delocalization length scale, which is the size of the wave function of a massive particle, if you want. And on the y-axis, I, I, I put the mass of that particle. And in a sense, today, uh, in, in, the, in the quantum science community, there are clearly two areas, which are on the two corners of that graph. On the one hand, there is the field of cavity optomechanics where really massive objects are prepared into the quantum regime and even prepared in superposition states. But please note that all these states have always a length scale given by the zero point motion, which is really, really tiny, much smaller than the nuclei of an atom. So you are definitely very big masses, but uh, smaller localization, uh, the localization distances. On the other hand, there are the famous matter wave interferometry experiments that started with the interference of electrons almost 100 years ago, where in all these experiments, always the, the localization distance is really large. The massive particle behaves really as a true, uh, as a wave. OK, so and of course, these started with elementary particles and, uh, and there were, that's why it's on that corner. Of course, it would be interesting to go to, to this space here. Where uh, there are where you would have large masses and large delocalization distance, okay. And why is would this be interesting? Well, basically for both fundamental and applied reasons. From the fundamental point of view, this is a completely unexplored parameter regime, a regime that uh, many people have predicted that quantum mechanics should break down through these collapse models that you might like or not, but they give very clear predictions, and and they always point into that corner. So it would be good to do experiments so that we can falsify these collapse models or at least and test whether quantum mechanics holds in that regime. At the same time, in that regime, this means you have a large mass which is really delocalized and hence the gravitational field it generates perhaps can be measured. And there are very interesting questions that ask what is the gravitational field generated by a big mass in a, that is large, uh, largely delocalized, okay? And, Many people find this very interesting because it points at questions on whether quantum mechanics, uh, whether gravity should be quantized or quantum mechanics should be uh, 
should include gravity. So, and there are many people interested in that. And of course, the applied reasons is that these states are going to be extremely fragile to the environment. And that also means they are very good uh, sensors. And I will talk about that. So the traditional approach to uh, go to that area comes from matter wave interferometry. And with these spectacular and seminal experiments, uh, in particular from the group of Marcus Arn in Vienna, where they are pushing the size of the mass that can be placed uh, in this in which you can observe the matter wave interference and actually the, the the world record these days is with these impressive biomolecules which have a mass of 10 to the 4 atomic mass units and this is really really impressive and they are making a lot of progress going into that direction we believe that from levitodynamics we can follow a novel approach which actually is coming from optomechanics and now following that direction where we already have a very large, massive object that is in the quantum regime, what we just need to do is delocalize the center of mass to larger scales. And this is a novel approach to get into that area. And this is what I want to discuss in, uh, in this talk. So that's the idea. So recall, so we start from nanoparticles that can be brought to the quantum regime and they have a wave function that is really localized of the order of the zero point motion that as I showed before, this is of the order of 10 to the minus 12 meters. And then the question is, okay, can I delocalize it to scales really larger than the zero point motion? And actually, can I even push it so that it could be delocalized even over scales comparable to the size of the particle, which is of the order of 100 nanometers. Please note that this is not to, it's not a, sc a scaled uh, plot because the wave function here has grown by five orders of magnitude, okay? So this is really expanding the wave function by many orders of magnitude, okay? So I want also to emphasize that these states are not superposition states. So in principle, they are less ambitious than preparing a macroscopic quantum superposition state, but I also think they are very interesting because if you keep the purity of this delocalized state, as I will show in a second, these states are really fragile also to the environment and can be used to test, for instance, collapse models. Good. So we believe that in le levitodynamics, there are three key ingredients that can be used to achieve something like that. The first one is ground state cooling has been already achieved, so we know how to prepare the center of mass of a nanoparticle in a pure quantum state by removing all the thermal fluctuations. The second one is that of, by definition, these nanoparticles are levitated and can be very well isolated from the environment. So potentially you can achieve very long coherent times. And third, and very importantly, uh, that the mechanical potential of the nanoparticle can be tuned as I said before, in a clamped mechanical oscillator, you cannot tune so easily, but here, this is like in, a, in, a, in, 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 in optical uh, manipulation of atoms. You can, of course, switch off the traps and, 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 and prepare all type of different potentials acting onto the nanoparticle. And in particular, uh, one can use inverted potentials, which is a potential in which uh, I will discuss that, an inverted harmonic potential. Good. So how... What do we want to do? So what we want to do is actually not only to expand the wave function to a length scale given by eta times x0, where now eta from now on is a dimensionless parameter that will parameterize how much do we expand the wave function compared to the zero point motion. But after expanding it, we would like to contract it back. Okay, so we want to expand the wave function and contract it back to the initial uh, state. Why is that? Several uh, reasons. First of all, as I will show in a second, when this state is expanded, it's extremely fragile. It, 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 it decoheres very fast. So we want to kind of inflate it and then compress it back so that we can prevent the, the coherence. Second, this would allow to more control into that type of experiments because it would expand, compress, and you will keep the particle on the same trap where you started. And this is good because for instance, you want to repeat these experiments many times. So you don't want to lose the nanoparticle because every nanoparticle is different as opposed to atoms. So you don't you want to use always the same particle. And also if you retrap the particle and you place it back to the initial state, you could measure the purity of that state, which is something we know to do or experimentalists know to do really well because that's what they need to do to probe that they have cooled to the ground state. So they know how to measure the temperature of the, of the center of mass nanoparticle. So if you would do such an experiment, you 
compress it back and then you show that you have kept the purity, you would indirectly certify that you have done this coherently and therefore expand it over larger scales. Because otherwise, to actually certify that you expand coherently is not so easy. And in a sense, that's what is behind the double slit. The double slit is a way to certify you have expanded over large scales. Okay, but if you don't do a double slit experiment, it's not so easy. However, that would be a way. Okay, good. So inspired a bit by AMO type of experiments, we want to see how to address this, uh, for instance, using optimal control technique. And this is one of the simplest uh, textbook uh, scenarios. So imagine we... Uh, assume the following. You have a, a, an harmonic potential, uh, as, so a particle moving in 1D with an harmonic potential who, which has a trap frequency and in particular a spring kind of constant that can be modulated in time. And uh, as it is experimentally motivated, we assume this spring constant is upper bounded, so it cannot be st stronger than some value, omega zero square but it can be negative. So we can assume for inverted or harmonic potentials. And then the question is, okay, if I want to start from that state, I want to compress and go back, what is the time modulation I should do such that I can do this very fast? And actually from all the possible optimal solutions, there is a very simple one that is what people call the bang bang solution in which you would make an instantaneous change of the harmonic potential. Okay, so you would start, we would start with a particle trap on harmonic, make it inverted, harmonic again, inverted, and then harmonic so that you can keep the particle. So the, actually the interesting protocol is only for these three steps, okay, inverted, harmonic, inverted, and has a total, and this, I will define the total amount of time required to do that by capital T. Let me show you why this uh, protocol works in a rather intuitive way. So for that purpose, I just show qualitatively the Wigner function of the center of mass state. So this is X and P, this is the Wigner function distribution. And this Y dot here is just to know where the center is. So initially, the, our initial, uh, the, the protocol starts by the particle being in the quantum ground state. So that's why you have this nice coherent Gaussian state, which has an, uh, a dispersion in X given by the zero point motion. So the first step of the protocol is then to actually um, place the particle on an inverted potential. And uh, if you think a bit about it, it's immediate to understand what happens. But if you are not, if you don't have that very fresh, you might be a bit surprised because the wave function, of course, doesn't split into two wave packets because this is a quadratic Hamiltonian. So it cannot split the wave function. What it does is actually it squeezes the wave function along this axis. Okay, uh, where because the particle both expands in X, but also accelerates, so it gains momentum. That's very different from free dynamics. A wave packet evolving in free dynamics expands in position, but the momentum keeps constant. Okay, so this gets squeezed. And what is very important is that now the size of this wave function it grows exponentially in time. Okay, because basically all the sinuses in the become sinus hyperbolicus. So you have this exponential growth. So if you would let the particle evolve uh, for uh, some units such that this is, uh, for instance, two, three or 10, this would grow really fast. And actually the state becomes squeezed in that, in that, uh, in that angle, in the 45 degrees angle. The next step of the protocol is now to actually place this state into an harmonic potential. So, and to tune the time it is in the harmonic potential such that it does this rotation, okay? So it brings the state now into the other diagonal. And if you think a bit what it's doing, it, what it's doing is actually it puts the part of the wave function that was on the right, now it will have negative velocities. So the part on the right of the wave function that wants to move to the left, and the part on the left of the wave function now has velocity to the right, okay? And this has to be tuned really carefully. Once you tune that, then you do the, the fourth step, which is to again apply an inverted potential, which looks a bit strange. But if you now realize that, of course, the part on the left has a velocity to the right, now the, the wave wants to go up. Okay, And this is what happens. If you let it evolve, actually it gets a squeeze, but it goes back to the same state. Okay, And, uh, and then the protocol will finish by putting again the harmonic trap and keeping the particle. So you see, at the end, we have done this protocol, but we end up into the same state. So summarizing, just to give you the whole picture. So that's the protocol we're running in a loop. So the important feature is the, the wave function expands uh, exponentially. And, uh, and actually you can see that these three unitaries here, so if you, this is the unitary time evolution operator with an harmonic potential, 
then the inverted and then harmonic. If you do this algebra, which is quite interesting, the product of these three unitaries is equal to just the unitary in between if you tune the time. So that means you apply these three unitaries, but this is equivalent to just apply an evolution over an harmonic oscillator. That's why if you apply this unitary to an eigenstate of an harmonic oscillator, such as the ground state, it does nothing. But of course, in between the time, at half of the protocol, the state is really different. It's very squished and large. Okay, so that's that's the, the idea. Of course, um, uh, this uh, protocol now have been has been discussed in the absence of decoherence. But what happens about decoherence? This protocol, of course, there will be always noises and, and the environment. So the question is now, how is the purity at the end of the protocol affected by the presence of noise and uh, decoherence? So um, the first thing to realize is that this protocol is very fast. And this is good because we prevent a single scattering event of an air molecule. And if you are at, for instance, uh, in high vacuum, in ultra high vacuum, 10 to the minus nine millivars, then uh, even if you would evolve for a time scale in units of omega zero of the order of 100, you would not scatter nearly any air molecule. And our protocols will be way faster. Okay, so we will make so the total protocol will be way faster than the time needed for uh, suffering a single scattering event, which would otherwise decohere completely the the wave function providing uh, which path information. However, in levitodynamics, there are other sources of noise, and the good thing is that they can all be modeled really well with this nice uh, master equation where the jam operator is just a position operator. So this is called displacement noise. This is in a sense our fluctuations of the center of the of the of the yeah of the particle. And this can be induced due, for instance, because of recoil heating. If you shine a laser, then there is recoil and the particle kind of suffers displacement noise. If the potentials are shaking, or even if the particle is emitting thermal photons, it also recoils and suffer, suffers displacement noise. And everything is encoded in this parameter gamma one. And this is something we control really well in the group. So we know how to evaluate this decoherence rate for all the standard sources of decoherence. So this will be a very important rate, gamma one. And know that, and this here it comes an interesting point, that if the wave, if the particle is really delocalized, such that eta is much larger than one, the decoherence rate that this delocalized state suffers is actually not given by gamma one, but gamma one times eta square, because you have x and x here. So you see how the larger the state is, the more, the larger the decoherence rate. And uh, second is, the second type of noise is what is called the frequency noise, which these are fluctuations on the, on the, for instance, trap frequencies of the potentials. And this is modeled always with this uh, master equation with an X square as a jam operator. This, for instance, in a laser would, would model the noise uh, due to RIN, to the relative intensity noise, but also models any error in time switching the potentials because an error in, in time switching is equivalent to an error in frequency. And this decoherence rate actually would scale for a large particle even stronger with a power of eta to, a, to eta to a power of four. That means that a very lightly delocalized state would at some point suffer decoherence dominated by frequency noise. Good, so going back to our loop protocol, what I could do now is to evaluate what is the purity of the final state as a function of decoherence. And this is what we do in this plot, which I find um, very interesting because it will quantify really well the, how fragile uh, these states are. So what I'm in the color, I'm plotting the purity of the state, the trace of rho square after the loop. And on the x-axis, I'm plotting uh, the decoherence rate, gamma one in units of the trap frequency omega zero. Then on the y-axis, this is the total time of the protocol, how, how, how long the protocol, uh, how, 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 yeah, how much time do we use for the protocol? And this is of course related to how much do we expand the wave function. In a, this is in a log scale and this is in a linear scale. So that, for instance, means if we want to expand a factor of 10, the wave function, the displacement noise should be of the order of 10 to the three, 10 to the minus three in units of omega zero. If we want to expand a one order more, then we would need to have the coherence rate uh, 10 to the minus five. If you want three orders or four orders, then you see here the progression. And just to show you, if you shine a laser light to a nanoparticle, you have recoil heating. And the typical number in these units is 10 to the minus two. So if you try to do this expansion in the presence of a laser light, you cannot expand a lot. So this already hints that all these experiments exploring microscopic physics at larger scales will require trapping 
without laser light or manipulating the particle without laser light. So with electrostatic traps or, or magnetic. And this, I think, quantifies really well how fragile these states are. So imagine that experiments can be done really to a control level that you can expand to larger scales. So what could we do with these states? So apart from, of course, testing quantum mechanics and falsifying collapse models, there are two things that we think that would be interesting to do. The first one is actually to realize that now this uh, loop or this particle will be very sensitive to static forces. And usually force sensors always measure uh, oscillating forces that are oscillating at the frequency close to the mechanical frequency, but measuring static forces is typically hard. So what happens now, if you run the loop in the presence of a static force, so just a very simple linear force, if you run the loop, you see you do the loop, but now you will end up into a state that is not at the center, but is actually displaced, okay? It has moved in X um, to, uh, towards the left because the force is assumed positive. And actually, what you can see is that the displacement uh, is enhanced by eta. So in a sense, the force is kind of magnified by eta, which is the expansion coefficient. Once it is uh, here, if you would now would put the harmonic trap, this would oscillate and this you could be able to measure this displacement uh, way better. To be more quantitative, so for instance, you could now calculate uh, the minimal force that could be measured using the quantum fissure information of the state after the loop, which now depends on the parameter f. And here what I'm plotting is first on the x-axis, the total time of the protocol, which is related to how much we expand, these in units, so that you know how fast it is. And on the y-axis is the force, first without units and on the right axis with units. And to compare, well, the solid line is with the force sensitivity in the loop. So you see with a very short experiment, you can measure really tiny forces of 10 to the minus 20 Newtons. And it's good to compare to what you would be able to measure if instead of doing the loop, you would just expand, uh, switch off the particle, let the particle expand and measure where it is, okay, doing. And which was, by the way, done by the group of Lucas Novotny with particles that were not called to the quantum regime, but uh, thermal. And this would be the comparison. You see that there is an enhancement, okay, which is in a log scale. Good. The second application that I also find very exciting would be in the context of trying to measure the two particles that are close to each other become entangled because of some static interaction between them. And this interaction could be weak. Of course, the long-term goal would be to do such an experiment with the gravitational interaction between two nanoparticles to be able to entangle the motion of two nanoparticles by a gravitational interaction force. But this is really, really hard. Another interesting possibility would be to entangle them by the Casimir, and also maybe just to entangle them as a proof of principle by the electrostatic force. Imagine you have two nanoparticles, they have one charge each, they interact really uh, uh, weakly, and you would like to, to entangle them. So imagine these two particles are moving in that axis, so they are separated always by at least a distance d. If you do the math, it's not hard at all to realize that if you now do a Taylor expansion of the typical interaction uh, form, the first term that dominates to the interaction is this linear term, which then gives you a standard uh, linear coupling between the two motions, where G will now define the coupling strength. And typically, we are interested in a scenarios where this coupling strength is really small. So you are in the small coupling regime. And therefore, it would be super hard to, for instance, entangle the motion of the two oscillators via this weak interaction. However, this interaction, note that now by increasing the size of the wave function, these fluctuations of x1 and x2 will grow. And effectively, effectively by growing, you also enhance the interaction strength by a factor eta square. And this means you would be able to entangle maybe two particles that otherwise would not get entangled. And just to show you, so here I, I plot also uh, x-axis the coupling strength if, if units of the mechanical frequency on the y the total amount of the pro, uh, of the protocol here in terms of expansion and then you see that for instance couplings as small as 10 to the minus six times the mechanical frequency which would be 0 0.1 hertz coupling strength still would allow you to entangle two particles if you expand them by a factor of 10 to the 2 10 to the 3 okay and this could be interesting and here we put the numbers for instance if you have two particles with one coulomb charge uh, you would still be able to entangle them in that scenario, even if they are separated by 40 times the radius of the particle, okay? And I think this is an experiment that, that could be very interesting to be done. 
With that, I will start uh, concluding. First, a fast summary of what I explained in the part two, which was this protocol that we have proposed where we expand the wave function and compress it back. This is interesting because it allows you to delocalize in principle the particle over larger scales and see the trade-off in terms of decoherence. So this is a very good sensor to measure what is the decoherence you have in the system. And, um, and this protocol is fast and sensitive. And this sensitivity can be used to enhance static force sensing and also the entanglement generation by weak forces. So I also want to tell you that in this context of exploring macroscopic quantum physics, we are very excited that very recently we were uh, awarded with a ERC Synergy grant precisely to do that, to, with the objective to, levitate it, to, levi uh, to bring levitated nanoparticles in large spatial quantum superposition states. And that's a very ambitious project that we will do jointly with three experimental groups, the group of Marcus Aspelmeyer in Vienna, Lucas Novoni and, the, uh, and, Ruk, and Roman Kidan at ETH uh, Zurich. And this is a very uh, challenging experimental project, but also theoretically super exciting. And we plan to start this project in May 2021. And of course, now there are open positions, both for experiments and for theory. So please uh, uh, reach out if you, if you are excited about these ideas. And with that, I would like to thank uh, all my team, in particular, um, uh, Mark uh, Roda and Talita, who have done this project that I have explained. And here there is a photo of the recent PhD graduation of Daniel Huma. And as I said, we are looking for uh, enthusiastic and interested uh, PhDs and postdoc students. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. So thank you very much, Ariel, for the really fascinating talk, um, the really interesting overview of where things are in the field and these exciting ideas as to what you might be able to do in the future. Um, so we have a number of questions on these things. Um, so starting sort of with, um, with one or two of the broader ones, um, uh, what are the main challenges in making these levitated particles um, bigger or smaller? So, so in a sense, what sets sort of the upper and lower bounds for the size of the particles that you're able to trap at the moment? Yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, an interesting question that, of course, can be answered in, in different ways. So if you are thinking about uh, bringing them to the quantum regime, the larger the mass, uh, the, the, the smaller the zero point motion is. So that makes it harder. But in terms of uh, optical manipulation, you want the particles to be smaller than the optical wavelength. Otherwise, the scattering and the heating you produce uh, is too large. So that will be a limitation. And then in terms of making them very small, also if they are very small, at the end you cannot trap them. Uh, and it's not so easy and it's also hard to uh, probe them. So these particles are very isolated, but this also means uh, it's not so easy to uh, detect them and measure them. So if they are too small, that would be a bit more difficult. Um, so sort of continuing on with what's sort of possible in these traps, and you, you mentioned at the end that it would be, or towards the end, that it would be helpful sometimes to have the traps without lasers to avoid sort of heating under certain circumstances. Uh, so sort of coming back to the beginning where both offer and you mentioned sort of uh, diamagnetically levitating frogs, um, what are the opportunities that you see in the future perhaps to use diamagnetic traps or combinations of sort of um, diamagnetic traps with optical traps? Um, What's the progress? Yeah, yeah, totally. This is, uh, of course, a, a very interesting uh, research line that already many experimental groups are pursuing to try to have a hybrid approach uh, to the manipulation of these particles. So light is good because you can uh, measure really well and do, for instance, feedback cooling. So all this progress in cooling to the quantum regime has been achieved with optical manipulation. So one could think about combining these things. And there are, for instance, in the group of Romain Kidan, he has a very recent paper where he combines a pole trap with an optical trap to have kind of a dimple potential where he has the, 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 yeah, the best of the two things. And then you could think about switching off lasers and leaving the particle on the electrostatic potential and so on. And in terms of diamagnetic levitation, uh, and this typically is associated to superconductors and then this requires cryogenic temperatures. So one should also differentiate room temperature experiments with cryogenic experiments and both have their uh, uh, cons and, and pros. Um, so we had lots of questions sort of about um, heating and decoherence in these experiments, also related to things you might be able to detect with the, the protocols that you, you presented. 
Um, so one question we had uh, from Inigo, uh, from Inigo Arizola is, um, is there any type of maybe spin echo experiment or dynamical decoupling type of protocol um, that could be used to protect bosonic states against frequency noise, for example? Uh, someone yeah, that. that's, that's a very interesting question. So uh, in a sense, this compressing loop, it looks like a bit like a spin echo type of experiments, but this is a mechanical oscillator, so it's not a two level uh, systems. So now I'm not aware of any idea uh, trying to do the typical tricks of, of dynamical decoupling uh, to prevent, for instance, frequency noise. But that's a that's a great uh, great question. So I'm not aware of any any idea in that direction. Okay. Um, so another question is, um, you know, could you use squeezed light um, for the optical trapping beams, and could that be used, for example, to reduce the displacement noise um, compared with uh, with classical laser light? Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, so. In the in the line of the projects I said that we 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 are doing more theoretical. Actually, we have a project where we really look carefully at the light matter interaction with electric particles. And, and we use that formalism to study the interaction of, of, of nanoparticles with, with squeeze light actually. So a bit going into the direction of that question. The problem though with the squeeze light is that as far as I know from my experimental colleagues, it's hard to have a lot of power. And for the optical tweezers, they need an experiment, they need a lot of power. And as far as I know, it's a bit hard to combine high power, high laser power with a lot of squeezing. Okay. Um, so we also had several questions about, you know, when you look at these systems, what are the limiting factors in terms of the, the natural types of heating that you get there? Um, so uh, several people in the audience coming from a, a background looking at trapped ions or, or neutral atoms are sort of asking, uh, what are the typical heating rates compared with sort of ions or atoms? And uh, do you find, for example, that the vacuum quality plays a role? I've had several questions as to whether this is maybe a negligible effect because your particle is large, or is this closer to dominant as you would have in, in cold atoms? Yeah. Um, what do you find them? Yeah. So regarding air molecules, if we, so experimentally, it has been a bit difficult until now to do these experiments in ultra high vacuum as we typically do with ions and atoms. However, now, for instance, here in Innsbruck, Tracy Northup is able to load nanoparticles already at 10 to the minus 11 millibars, and that's great. So if we can do experiments there, air molecules will not be an issue. As Then the other type of decoherence is uh, recoil heating, so scattering of, air pho of photons. And the typical numbers there uh, for the typical powers you have is 10 to the minus 2 omega 0. And so that's kind of uh, 10 to the 3 so one kilohertz of kind of heating rate. Okay, that's a typical decoherence rate due to recoil heating. If you then remove laser, in my opinion, then what comes is uh, uh, vibrations. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you don't have surfaces and anything nearby that there could be fluctuating fields, then vibrations are gonna be challenging. And uh, let me show you, I think I have a backup slide here. So mm -hmm. for instance, in this plot that I showed, I only showed the upper panel, but now if you, uh, uh, put this displacement, uh, this decoherence rate in terms of displacement noise in units of meter per square root of Hertz. For instance, numbers such as 10 to the four, this requires displacement noise of at the order of 10 to the minus 16 meters per square root of Hertz. And this is achieve achievable in the current experiments, but if you want to push farther, this means getting to displacement noise at the level of LIGO almost. So you, you, know, you start to be, to be careful. So I guess for ex for the experimental audience, I guess this plot might might be useful. So, but um, yeah. So we also had a question in the chat specifically asking about a gravitational acceleration noise. Um, so I imagine this would come from tidal effects or things like that. I mean, if you have a look at the numbers on here, is that is that been negligible compared with the sorts of things that you would have in typical vibrations in the experiments or? Um, is that a, a, an important factor in some of these or could it be? Yeah, it's, it's an important factor and also an opportunity. As I said, some of these experiments, they want to use gravimetry. They want to use this acceleration sensitivity to measure what is the gravitational field, which could be 
useful to detect oil by knowing uh, that the mass density below you is different or to detect some things that are going up. One should differentiate in noise analysis, noises that are oscillating at frequencies close to the mechanical frequency or at very low frequencies. So these, typic, these things that move very slowly, they produce noise at very low frequencies, which are bad if you do need to do experiments in which you want to repeat because then there are drifts and things like that. So it's important to recall the scale as in quantum optics experiments, uh, we also want to do very fast experiments. So everything that happens on a much slower time scale in principle, it's less uh, important. But I'm not an experimentalist, so I might be saying things <laughs> completely wrong. Huh? So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess it's an interesting combination here in, in this area because you have opportunities to detect things that might be hard to detect another way, but at the same time, uh, you're then sensitive to things going on in the lab that you might not have anticipated. Totally, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's always the case, yeah. Um, so another question in a slightly different direction. Um, when you started uh, introducing your loop protocol, um, you made a distinction between uh, forming a... a a, a delocalized state of your of your trapped nanoparticles and uh, creating a superposition state. Um, so sometimes uh, I would, for example, think of a of a delocalized particle as, as something you could write as you know a, 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 a sort of an integral over sort of superpositions of the particle being at different points in space. So I wanted to ask why you made that that distinction sort of um, uh, clear in that in that form. And if you were thinking of something other than this as being a superposition state, you know, what would that be? And in what sense would that be different in this type of protocol? Yeah, so uh, this is a question I, I really like a lot. So in, in the sense in quantum optics, we, we always want to prepare what we call non-Gaussian states. So states in which the Wigner function is negative. And clearly a superposition state is a clear manifestation of that. We have all seen these nice uh, Schrodinger cat states in the Wigner function where there are all these interference things. Of course, a state like that one, the localized, it's a pot. It's, it doesn't have a negative being a function. So some people in quantum optics would call that this is not that quantum. In my, in my view, in a sense, what, what this state has is that it's very difficult to probe that uh, this is a quantum state. In a sense, when we prepare a superposition, uh, this is a, so if you think about the double slit experiment, in the sense before you touch the double slit, you have a delocalized state. What you do after you touch a double slit, for me, this is a way to demonstrate that you have a microscopic delocalized state. You prepare a superposition, then you let it above and you see the interference pattern. And this is a, 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 an ambiguous demonstration. Um, but in terms of some of the applications that we want to do, I agree that it's not so clear uh, what is the key advantage of a, of, a, of a quantum superposition state compared to a largely delocalized state. So, and this actually, I've changed my view recently about these things because I was always obsessed on thinking how to prepare superposition states instead of localizing only. Uh, that's really interesting. As, so you would sort of, so for you a superposition state in the sense you would have previously thought about it is something where you have a, a negative Wigner function. Um, yeah, right. yeah. The good thing is that then you could measure that state observe negativity of the Wigner function. And of course, any experimentalist then is very happy because that's an, an ambiguous demonstration of a clear quantum state. Uh, whereas measuring the purity of, of a Gaussian state, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm also, yeah. So something maybe on a more uh, experimental level, um, we also had a question. Um, that, so in your scheme, um, the bang-bang protocol is applied at time intervals that correspond to harmonics of the harmonic oscillator frequency. Mm -hmm. um, seems maybe that this could make it extremely sensitive to noise on the drive, um, because that would then lead to, to parametric heating. Yeah. Um, what are the sort of corresponding scales and uh, is there a way somehow to circumvent that heating in the... Uh... No, no, that, that's, that's super important actually. And um, so, as a, so the idea is that uh, this error in the frequency or in the switching time is equivalent to an, uh, an error in the frequency because if the frequency is fluctuating, this is the same as error. And, uh, and then uh, if I show you this plot that I didn't show, which is the same as the, the other before, but in terms of frequency noise, Okay, and just to get the plot, so here on the on the y-axis, this is telling you the error in the frequency. So that means a value of 10 to the minus seven 
uh, means that the this frequency of 10 to the 5 hertz will be up to seven digits uh, uh, stable. And that's the typical number you have for the, for the best uh, lasers. The relative intensity noise is typically minus 140 decibels, and that corresponds to 10 to the minus 7 kind of fix. So, and with that, you, you can expand a factor of 10. But if you want to expand a factor of 3, then you see your frequency should be stable up to a, frequency, up to a level of 10 to the minus 11. Okay, and, and you can now translate this error in frequency in error in switching time. And of course that becomes very challenging. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, definitely. But at the same time, one could think maybe that's also an opportunity because then this loop is extremely sensitive to all of that. So, and it's very fast. So maybe you can measure this thing. So, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So thinking about the applications, um, another question we sort of had is sort of about um, measuring gravitational fields. And you mentioned uh, gravity gradiometry before, for example. Um, what do you see as the advantages of using a sort of a macroscopic reference mass compared with, for example, using an atom interferometer where you use sort of just sort of individual atoms there? Because there seem to be sort of uh, challenges and trade-offs in terms of the, the size of the thing you're trying to measure versus, you know, how easy it is to track things and measure them safely. Sure, sure, sure. But uh, from the fundamental point of view, the, I want to make a very important dis distinction. In these atom interferometers, they measure classical gravity. Whereas here, the, the outlook would be to generate a gravitational field coming from a source that is in a quantum state. And that's very different. Okay, and I was referring more into that direction. If now you want to use these nanoparticles to measure classical gravity, it's true, maybe there is no clear advantage compared to atom interferometers in, in measuring, uh, let's say, gravity at larger scales. The difference is that these massive particles have a very high mass density, and therefore they can be put very close to other masses. And I think the niche is there in measuring gravity at short distances, which is something that with atoms that occupy a big volume is a bit more difficult. So I think uh, the, the, where the nanoparticles could have impact is in measuring gravity at short distances. And also that's more speculative about the amazing possibility to measure, uh, generate a gravitational field from a mass that is in a superposition state that is large enough to be measured. Uh, but that's much more ambitious, definitely. So as, as one final question then, let me ask, of all of these really fascinating potential application areas that you've mentioned during the talk, um, which excites you the most and which do you think is most likely to give rise to the, the next most interesting things in the next few years? Oh, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I think I'm super excited about the possibility to prepare macroscopic superpositions. So to really delocalize these, wave, these nanoparticles over larger scales, uh, because this is super exciting, not only from the fundamental point of view, but from the physics point of view, how to do that. Uh, it's not easy because these systems are extremely fragile. So we need to find the, 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 the way to go there. And, and this is, you know, you need to be very creative to think what is the way to get there. And to be able to do that in combination with experimental progress, which now we find so, we are so lucky that so many experimental groups are interested in these things. So this is in, um, very exciting. So in short, preparing microscopic quantum superpositions, definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ariel, for the really great talk in a fascinating area and really exciting area. Um, and yeah, so just on behalf of the whole audience and all of us here at the Quantum Science Seminar, I thank you very much. Yeah, I thank to all of you for your attention. It's a great pleasure. And thank you once more for organizing this. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we'll hand back to Sebastian for the final words. Yes, thank you also from my side, Oriol. This is a really cool talk. Um, I'd like to uh, finish up by mentioning that next week on December 3rd, we'll have yet another talk on a very different subject by Rob Schilkopf, who will be talking about circuit uh, QED. If you want to get notified uh, of what we do, please go to our website, uh, quantumscienceseminar.com, subscribe to our email list and our Google calendar, follow us on Twitter. I'd like to mention that our sister seminar, the virtual AMO seminar, will take a break this week because of Thanksgiving, but they will be back next week with another talk for you guys. If you want to join us for a Q&A session with Oriol, please dial in with the Zoom link that I uh, just put into the YouTube chat window. Thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again next week. Same time, same place. Bye.